I work from home. I have a wife that goes into a big office and talks to people and works with people all day. I have an 11 month old son that I drop off at daycare and pick up every day. But when I'm home and when it's five days a week, Monday through Friday, I am pretty much by myself. And as an introvert, that's very nice. I do love working from home, but at the same time, it feels like I really need to make more of an effort to just be with people. And that doesn't necessarily mean physically, but it more just means that day in and day out, I'm not really interacting with a ton of people. Like obviously I work with other people, I meet with other people online, but it doesn't really satisfy what makes me connect with others. And that's a big thing for me. Like being an introvert is one thing and it's nice because being at home and working from home, you're always going to feel recharged. But at the same time, it's not a perfect one-sided thing. It's a pendulum that swings and changes. And there are times where I need human interaction. I need to be with friends. And one of those things that helps me do that, that helps me to connect with people outside of my house, outside of my family, outside of my friend groups, is to read. And I've always been a big reader. Obviously, like many others, I fall in and out of love with it at times. Reading is the way that I can hear new perspectives, the way that I can feel empathy towards as many stories and styles and types of people that is imaginable. Like books are an infinite way to learn more about other people. This YouTube thing as a 32 year old man, almost 33, but not yet. This YouTube thing is really difficult because the thing with social media is I don't necessarily think the way that it's used or consumed is healthy for a lot of people. I don't have an Instagram. I don't have a TikTok. I don't have a Snapchat. Like it's not really for me because I like being alone. I don't really like to see procured and manicured versions of other people. I like humanity. I like seeing the real person behind anything. So this channel is mostly going to be a book channel. I love reading. I love talking about the books that I'm reading. I love sharing that with my wife and I love sharing that with my friends. So you might be a new friend. What's up friend? Today we're talking about the will of the many. Now every day I love to make sure that the house is in order, that I just clean up a little bit. It gives me a sense of purpose when I'm not working. It gives me something to drive to every day so that when my wife gets home, she doesn't have to do it. She has a really difficult and strenuous job, mentally draining and taxing. So it's just nice to have a home that feels cleaner than when you left it. So that's how we're gonna do these. I feel like it's also kind of boring for me to do chores, to wash dishes, to feed cats, to make the bed. But why not talk to you about books that I'm reading or have read while I do that so that it makes it a little bit more fun. You guys get something visually appealing, maybe. I have no idea why that is. I feel like the meta of YouTube is changing to the point where it's like getting back to just <laughs> watching people do things that are part of normal life because we've all kind of gone in these different directions that make it difficult to remember what life was like, what life is like for other people. Is any of this even making sense to you? It feels like I'm some pretentious dude just trying to make a video essay about nothing, but really like this is my introduction to making a YouTube channel and talking about books. Okay, so let's start with the characters in Will of the Many, and this is going to be at first a no spoiler discussion about the Will of the Many. Something that I loved about the characters in this book is that they all felt distinct and 
even when I disagreed with something that they did or why they did something, I could at least understand their reasoning for doing that. And I think that is something so special that books can do and also miss all the time is like, I get and understand the perspective and I have maybe not the, the same viewpoint, but at least I can understand why they made that decision and why they're going in this direction. I feel like that gets missed so much in books where it's like things are just happening and people are just doing things, but it doesn't really make sense either from a human perspective, like I'm reading this and they're just going about the story or based on their backstory and experience as I know them, it doesn't necessarily make sense for what they're doing. But in The Will of the Many, whether it was Viz or Misa or even like the jailer that Viz was starting in the book with, like we didn't, we obviously didn't get a ton from that guy, but even the way like he was playing the chess game or whatever they call it and where he was in his life, like all of that just seemed to make sense to me. It made sense where characters were. It made sense why characters were doing things. Viz himself, the main character, is deeply flawed, mostly because he's gone through trauma and he's still like an older teenager from what I gather. He's not necessarily an anti-hero because he is easy to root for. And that's another thing about Viz, like he embodies a lot of tropes within the fantasy genre. Like fantasy is probably the one genre that I read the most. Viz is an amalgamation of many tropes within fantasy, but at the same time, it doesn't feel tropey. Like the tropes are there to make you feel comfortable with things that you already know or have read before. And at the same time, he's still a deeply flawed character because of his trauma, because he maintains such a mask for everyone that he talks to or interacts with. And at those moments in the book where he starts to like talk about his past or tell someone the truth, that actually feels like a, me as a reader, I'm getting relief for Viz on behalf of Viz and they're like cathartic parts of the book to read. And I think you can't do that or make a reader feel that way unless you've done a really good job of providing context of who these characters are and why they're making decisions. All of those characters, I can find something in them that I can relate to. And it makes it that much easier to feel empathy or feel like, yes, this story makes complete sense because if I was in that character's shoes, like I would do the same thing. Or if I would do something different, I at least understand why they're making that decision. And truly, like, it's not just Viz, it's not just the main character that I feel this way about. And that's what makes this book so special. Like, I just feel a certain way towards many of the characters that are in this book. Okay, I mentioned tropes, and I just want to talk about this for one second, because Will of the Many, like, James Islington has written a fantasy series before, and I'm actually reading it right now, the first book. Um, the Shadow of What Was Lost. Now, it's very obvious that James Islington is leaning on a lot of tropes. Like, we have talented orphan that's adopted by someone that's higher up within the society. We have the academia going for it, like Harry Potter and Hogwarts. We have, um, even towards the end, we have like a Hunger Games type competition, and that's what the the book is building up to towards this competition. Like all of these tropes are there. We even, like Viz, not just is he an orphan that's adopted by someone higher up in the, the hierarchy, but he's also a long lost prince of the people that were subjugated by the people that are currently in rule. There are so many tropes that have been done before and almost like to credit this book and even though you know it's tropey, even though you know like there are moments that you've read before or are, like taken from other parts of books, fantasy series, even like ancient history, this is very obviously a Roman type society. Like the tropes actually add to the story in a way where it's like comforting to you to know that there's something that is familiar there 
while at the same time being different enough and like human enough within the tropes to make it so that you keep reading so that you're not like upset about the tropes you're actually happy that they're there because they keep you grounded within the story and like really if we're being honest tropes are tropes because they work like tropes wouldn't be tropes unless they were in a lot of stories that are popular and you know what if you're gonna be an author like most things have been done before so take what works take what you do well and make it work for you and i feel like in the will of the many the tropes were done really well to the point where you're not thinking about like oh i know exactly what's gonna happen oh i'm so tired about the academia i read this in every book like they're different enough that it feels unique and original to this story now speaking of james islington I want to take a moment because The Will of the Many was the first book that I read from this author. And it's become very apparent to me now after being like a little over halfway in The Shadow of What Was Lost, which was his first book that he wrote, I think. Um, it's very apparent that The Will of the Many is a book that he took a giant leap forward in terms of his writing ability. and. Not that he's a bad author in A Shadow of What Was Lost or that it's a bad story. I actually quite like it. It's just that like he's fixed everything that is a problem in that book series and he's amplified the things that he's really good at. Now, if you don't want the book spoiled, this is where you shut off the video because I'm going to talk a little bit about the ending now. So the ending in The Will of Many was kind of like a mind fuck. The story up until that point didn't really blend into like a science fiction style story. There's like moments here and there where you're like, okay, this is kind of going outside the bounds of fantasy, but like you don't really know a ton about the magic system because you're watching it from the eyes of people that are like subjugated and don't really know a ton about it. The ending though is like, this other world not really time travel but like clone clones are kind of a thing uh different universes and realities are kind of a thing so i you know if i didn't know more about this author and i'm kind of i'm really happy that i'm reading a shadow of what was lost right now because one of the things that he is really good at and it's obvious within even his first book is that he's a planner that he knows how to set something up and have it be paid off really nicely. Now, if that weren't the case and I read the ending of The Will of the Many, I would still be like, oh, that was a great ending, but I have no idea how this is gonna get pulled off. I have no trust in the author to go in this direction and make it work. But for The Will of the Many, because this is a strength of his, because he's a planner, because setups and payoffs are something that he's really good at, it makes me feel some type of way that the will of the many and the hierarchy story are kind of in good hands of someone that, like, no matter how this book ended and no matter how, like, out of left field it felt for the rest of the story, I actually trust James Islington to be someone within the, the author sphere that could actually do this and be successful. So there's kind of like this trust that I have built in him innately because it's already something that I can see in his other books and that I hear about his other stories is that he's someone that plans everything out and knows exactly what he's doing. Like nothing, the ending didn't happen to just like surprise people. The ending happened because it is going to have reverberating effects that make sense to you later on in the story. And that's something that really excites me about the next book. Like there have not been many book series that I've read in the last few years that haven't already been completed because like obviously A Song of Ice and Fire, everyone's been burned by that. Patrick Ruthfuss is another one where it's just like, you don't trust authors <laughs> very much to finish series that the first or second books are amazing. Now, obviously being in the fantasy genre, I love Brandon Sanderson. He's one of my favorite authors. He's someone 
where even if a series is not finished, I know that he's going to be writing like 17 books a year. So I can kind of understand that in two or three years, once he's passed Stormlight 5 or started the next Mistborn or Defiant, or Skyward, whatever, like there will be more books in this series. I think with James Islington, because he's writing at a pretty fast clip and because one of his strengths, either from The Will of the Many or in his other series, is his ability to plan out everything and have it be a really nice payoff. That actually feels good to me where like I've finished the first book, I'm excited about the second, and I'm excited because I trust in this author to make everything make sense. So the last thing that I want to talk about in The Will of the Many is something that I've been thinking about a lot as I finished some other series, and that's how everything in this story is actually interesting. There's not really a ton of wasted space, and the pacing of this story just goes and goes and goes. Like, this really is a story where you kind of never want it to end and you want to keep reading. And that's, those are some of the best stories that I can possibly think of is, this is a pretty big book. Um, right now I'm reading The Shadow of What Was Lost and a book called Demon Copperhead, which is more just fiction, it's not fantasy. But both of those stories seem to be going a lot slower than The Will of the Many, even though probably word count and book size wise, they're the exact same. But in The Will of the Many, like I'm, it didn't feel that long to me to be reading. And whether I was reading it or listening to audiobook, like the pacing was really amazing. And one thing I really love about this book, I do want to talk about this because it's something that I really love about Joe Abercrombie's books. If you've read the First Law trilogy, something Joe Abercrombie does a lot is he like skips time. So if someone's traveling and nothing happens when they're traveling, he just doesn't write about it. Like it's not interesting. You just, and in The Will of the Many, there are moments where it's like, okay, it's three weeks later because it makes sense. Like they're in a school setting, they're learning things every day. Not every day is gonna have something incredible, amazing happen. And I really respect that because as a reader, it feels like my time is respected, that they're not just gonna make something happen just to make something happen. And you also trust that like the time is moving at a clip that makes sense for the story. So it makes the pacing really nice and it also doesn't feel like I'm out of breath from the pacing. It doesn't feel unnatural that like something is always happening. There's really good arcs and movements within the story of like, there's a big thing coming up, you get a little bit of a payoff, but it creates another mystery. And then there's kind of like these little bits and bobs that you get throughout. The last thing in The Will of the Many is just like every part of the society is interesting to me. Obviously the factions of military versus government versus religion, those are gonna be interesting in themselves. The hierarchy, like the pyramid between people that give their will away to like the octavi and everything else above them, like all of those differences are really interesting. But I think what was actually most interesting, and again, I have no idea how he pulled this off, is like the inner workings of each of those factions, the infighting, the, the flawed characters between them, especially in military. You think at the beginning of the book when, when Viz first gets, um, first gets adopted, it's gonna be like, okay, I'm gonna solve this mystery for this guy. He's gonna bring me up in military, blah, blah, blah. No, because military have their own problems. Religion have their own problems. The guy that runs the school, I forget his name right now, but like he's a flawed character and he has like a backstory and a history with uh, Viz's new dad. All of these little things add to the part of the story where it feels like a full and fleshed out world because you're not saying like it's just religion versus military because that's an obvious thing to be at odds with each other but it's actually like these three factions within military that all want different things for different reasons uh, i didn't even talk about the actual bad people or like who's supposed to be the bad person in this because the ending makes 
a lot of sense. Like obviously there was foreshadowing to the ending, but there are moments in this book where you're like, they've never even mentioned that. I have no idea how this, what, what is this power? Is this even a will user? This is such a ramble. Oh my God, I, I need to be more concise. I am going to make sure in the edit that all of this makes sense. Just know this is like the 35th minute of me talking about this book and you're probably watching me right now in like the eighth. I cannot say enough good things about this book. I think that's where I'll wrap it up. The characters are wonderfully done. I can find myself little bits and pieces in each of them. They are flawed yet human and make sense. The tropes are there to make you feel comfortable yet feel original and unique in this story. None of the characters are good or bad. You kind of need to decide for yourself through their motivations and their history and what their reasoning is for doing things, if they're good or bad or if you're on their side. The infighting and the people that are at odds with each other all make sense. It adds to this full, this full picture of a living and breathing world where there's not just like 10 main characters and everybody else in the world revolves around them, but there's millions of people and all of them have their own inclination to add to this story. And I think that is really special. Now, I would recommend The Will of the Many to anyone that loves fantasy. I would recommend it to anyone that is looking to get into fantasy. It doesn't really have a complicated magic system. Now, I'll, I'll put a caveat on that. It might, but the way that we learn about the magic system is through the lens and the eyes of people that don't know much about it, which allows you to not really understand it either, but still have a like cursory understanding to make it make sense as you read. The author isn't trying to show off their world building. They are showing you their world through their interactions with their characters. And I think that's a really beautiful way to write fantasy. Now, James Islington, I have high hopes for him. I've gone back, like I said, I'm about 60% through a shadow of what was lost. And honestly, as much as it's like a like for like copy of the eye of the world. Talk about tropes on tropes on tropes that sometimes don't work. Um, a shadow of what was lost is that. But it's actually, it's, I can see again the strengths of James Islington and even if there are tropes upon tropes, even if the characters in the first book at least are somewhat one-dimensional, I am interested enough because he sets things up and pays them off so well. And that to me sometimes is just as good as reading about character development and character arcs. The Will of the Many, five out of five stars. The Shadow of What Was Lost, we will see. That'll probably be one of the next few books that I talk about. Guys, this is a brand new channel. So please do subscribe, give a like to the video. And what's most important to me is that you leave a comment down below letting me know what you think. If this format works for you where I'm just doing things throughout the house because I'm lonely and want to talk to friends about books that I love, let me know how that works down below in the comments. Anyways, we've come to the end. My name is Jake Landau and I'll see you next time. Guys, I just want to say something because I just finished uh, doing the laundry for my son. All of the socks matched. There's no leftover socks. I don't think that has ever happened in the history of baby laundry. I just want to say that. That's how I'm going to end the video. No lost socks. Fuck yeah!